Hey guys, my name is Steve Guttenberg and I am the Audiophiliac. This guy over here, he's Herb Reichert from Stereophile. We've done a bunch of these videos and by the way, there is a playlist so you can see the all Herb playlist on the channel. And you can, you can do a mini marathon of Herb. <laughs> anyway, to celebrate that and so much more on the sixth anniversary of this channel, which, which is August 14th, Herb and I are going to do a live stream together. That's our first live stream ever. And uh, I'm really excited about it. It's uh, fraught with uh, technical difficulties, but I don't care. We're going to do this thing anyway. One way or another, it's going to happen. And we're going to take uh, live questions. Uh, this episode today, we're going to respond to some of the questions you guys emailed in. But we'll probably do some live uh, question and answers during the stream on August 14th at 6 o'clock Eastern. So come back for that. Set your calendar or watches or alarms or something for that. In today's show, though, we are going to answer your questions later on. And there will be an Audiophiliac viewer system of the day later in the show. But to start, we're going to start with how the introduction of the CD slash digital changed the audiophile world pretty much right up to this date. And that happened way back in 1982. So that's uh, 41 years ago. And the divisions that were set in place then are actually still happening now. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't think, the, the structure of the difference, the only thing that's maybe changed is I think there's not so much pressure on people to say, oh, I like analog too. I think right. for about 30 years, <laughs> yes, that's you had true. to be sort of brave to say, well, I prefer analog. Right. I mean, you would be ridiculed for that. Right, right. Yeah. And I don't like, think why? it's that way yeah. anymore. Yeah. I think recently that's changed. I think we've come to some <laughs> agreement about that part, yeah. But what I'm thinking is, so in this early days of how it affected the audiophile world was, that in the early days it was really Sony and Philips players. That's because it was their format. They co-created the format. Then it was Sony players and Philips players and other people started using basically those as uh, the bed to do their own thing. You know, like when uh, Meridian made their first CD player, it was really a Philips player that they had modified, right? But I remember California Audio Labs, their thing was that they used Magnavox, same thing as Philips, and then did a tube uh, analog stage. And that was a big deal. Remember those? Oh, was California show. Audio Labs? Oh. And it was like a, an interesting idea because it was a great bridge from the more mainstream to the audiophile world because they say, well, you know, it's really the analog section that's going to define the sound of this player. And therefore, and was true, that uh, the did. California <laughs> Audio Labs players were much better sounding than the Magnavox slash Philips players. And I, and I was just talking to somebody about it recently who still has a California Audio Labs and still uses wow. it and still loves it and everything. Yeah, it's got that vintage sound. You know, it's an early chipset, blah, blah, blah. It's a ladder DAC, et cetera, et cetera. So, but, but, but then, you know, here and there, the audiophile manufacturers started to get more, you know, involved in it and, you know, pushing the needle forward. And it did eventually become the mainstream of, of uh, the audiophile electronics companies in the United States and Europe and Japan to make, let's call them high-end uh, CD players. You know, there, during that period, there was an interesting thing going around among consumers of uh, music playback from Tower and even among audiophiles. It separated out. That California Audio Labs player it's basically, here's a player that we think sounds good, right. not tests well, right, or right, right, does right. all the digital things that it's supposed to do. Right. And I thought that was kind of a gracious moment in, di in the early era of digital, mm -hmm. was just saying, look, it can sound good too. Yeah. And then the AccuPhase, when I was working at Sound by Singer the store, we started selling this very high-end AccuPhase CD player. Uh, Even then, I think it was like $12,000. I still aspire to that. Yeah. I and mean, it was, that's what I want. It was built like a freaking tank. I mean, it was super heavy, and the way the drawer just, you know, glide, it was incredible. And it sounded really good. You know, I bought my TAC 
because I couldn't afford an acupace, right. basically. Yeah, so there, was, so there was that. And the other one that was a big deal was Revox, of all company. They made still CD. are. They made, they made a great CD player in, in Which the Which I never days. heard, really. No, I sold lots of those. Really? Yeah, it was, it was exceptionally good. And of course, yeah, I guess the Meridian CD players. I sold a lot of Meridian CD players. As a matter of fact, that was my first CD player was a Meridian CD player. I think it was called 206, 205 or 206 or something like that. It looked really nice and, uh, and it sounded good. Meridian, Bob Stewart, <laughs> long before there was MQA. Yeah, he was, he was into it early on. And uh, it changed the way the, the audiophile retail scene was. And then there was the divide. Remember, the divide between stereophile and the absolute sound that Harry Pearson just came out early on and said, no, LPs are way better, not even close, and he would begrudgingly uh, review, you know, uh, digital and stereophile stuff. stereophile embraced it. J Hart, J. Gordon Holt embraced right. it, like, instantly. Right, so J. Gordon Holt so embraced uh, CD that he basically, I'm done with vinyl. It's over. There's no contest, right? So there was this sharp fork in the road between the stereophile people and the absolute sound people, I don't just mean the writers, I mean the readers of those magazines, that they were they went one way or the other. Harry Pearson had what I regard as one of the great lines of all history of audio journalism. The best way to enjoy a CD is to sell all your LPs. Right. Right. Or I thought my memory was, he said, the best way to enjoy digital is never listen to analog. Something like Some that. Some variation. Something like that. that. But that maybe would, he never even said it. And right. It's just urban legend right. or something. But whatever it was, it that some version of that was the truth. That if you never really listen to analog in a serious way from you know the eighties forward, you might be perfectly happy with digital. Well that's still and true. And many people as are. a reviewer, yeah. I'll spend a whole month reviewing DAC mm -hmm. or DACs. Mm -hmm. And it's the whole month is digital and mostly streaming because I don't have an in-house CD player that works. And then the next month I'm reviewing, for example, this month, the tone arm and some cartridges. And I hardly listen to streaming at all, at least while I'm still awake. <laughs> and it's really amazing to be able to go a whole month right, right. without digital. Right, right, right. And when you first go back to it, there's a moment like, is that really all it is? <laughs> is that what it is? But then 48 hours later, you don't care because streaming is really kind of a magic thing, that infinite right. access yeah. you know, to music. Right. I came to New York because I thought, here's an infinite peer group. You could meet anybody, Bob Dylan, Lou Reed, before you go to sleep. That's how I feel when I stream. I right. could find Anything. the most amazing piece of music I've ever heard. That's and my record collection, I know I'm not going to do that. Right, right, yeah. So they, they can coexist. I think, right. I think that's a beautiful thing. You don't have to pick a side. You can enjoy both. That's, that's my feeling right yeah. there. You don't need to pick a side. So we're going to do this uh, Take Your Questions. And... Uh, Herb and I have uh, perused these questions, and I have selected the questions, and I want to thank everybody who sent in questions, but you have to understand we can't answer everybody's questions. So do our best, and uh, let's, see what we, let's see what we got here. I'm ready. Evan has the first question, and the first question is, what role does craftsmanship and the aesthetics of the piece of a given component or speaker play a role in how you feel about it? Does that make sense to you? Absolutely. Yeah. And it, I mean, it's not an unusual question, but it's one that's even tough to answer right. in a review. Right. And it's not really talked about that much. How that, how we feel about a product isn't just how it sounds. It's I talk about knob feel a lot because I think, especially with preamplifiers, especially if you don't use a remote control, how it feels in your hands. You like it because of that, or you're kind of like, eh, it feels kind of. You know, cheap I'm or a something. transformer guy. Ah, right? okay. I really like to take the cover off and see. I like I like iron. The more iron I see, the better I feel. Okay. And to secure iron, it's heavy. You have to bolt everything together. You need a have the reason you need heavier chassis is because you don't have a wall wart. <laughs> you know, you got a big piece of you know toroidal iron sitting in the middle. Right. More than craftsmanship, I don't really care, but I do respond, and 
many of my friends, I think, do. Part of the beauty of horns and triads is that they're beautiful. Right, right, I mean, right, right. What's not to like about horns and great big bright emitting triads? After all, our friend Devin Turnbull had oh. a show in a sculpture gallery of his horns and his He's other He's having electrons. another one Another right one now. right now in, in London. London right. At a really major so gallery. Where it is that crossover from it just being audio to being art. Talk about craftsmanship and aesthetics. There you go, that's exhibit A right there. And I think it's part, I mean, it, it, no one would, could say, oh, I just, it's purely intellectual. I mean, horns and try, especially when you get in big horns. Right. It's just you feel privileged to be sitting in front of them. Yep. I can't say that with more generic hi fi. Right, right, right. Now, the second question comes from Philip, and he wants to know what does the gear need to do? that lets us feel more from the music? In other words, be specific. I get the what, question. Yeah, okay, <laughs> I mean, In fact, you know, these are questions, if you do what I do, you know, every day, type, you've got to think about this. Right. That's an important question. And strangely, now that I'm old, I'm finally kind of getting to it. And I've, I've come to believe that Pratt, or rhythm keeping, pace, rhythm, and timing is what carries the message, and it's what holds you in. I mean, I think once you're in, you can explore like Alice in Wonderland, but to get the feeling of the artists, their, their energy, their... Yeah, yeah. It, and I watch them play. It's in the rhythm. Right. That's I my would, answer I would to agree. that question. But you know what? I've had this new thing that's been going on for a couple of months. And it, it happened the other day. I'm listening to this Randy Newman record called Good Old Boys. And it's from 1974. And it's, it's, got a, it's got a lot of production. It has strings. It has brass. It's got all this stuff. And yet it feels very in the moment. And I'm playing this record and I'm listening to it and thinking, I feel like with my eyes closed, I can see Randy Newman. And I can see all these musicians around them. Now, I don't know if this was literally a live in the studio recording, but it feels that way. And I feel like what he's singing right now is happening right now. Like I'm, tra it's, it's a cliche. It feels like I'm transported through time, but it feels like I'm listening in on the event of that session. That's what does it for me. I still look for that. I mean, once I'm actually inside the thing, and this is kind of what I like about you know streaming all the different kinds of things. You can just it takes you first to first you notice the recording, then you notice the musicians playing, maybe in a room with a light on them like Segovia or something. And then the next thing you know, you're in Madrid in a in a cafe. Mm -hmm. I like where it takes the mind. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what I mean. Yeah. So there you go. Thank you, Philip. This question comes to us from Kevin, and it's really directed more at, at her because it's about these speakers that he's having a love affair with, the Heretic AD 614s. But it is about the types of speakers, you know, and how, how we sort of are drawn to different types of speakers, even more than brands, you know, like horn speakers or electrostatic speakers, that's what I mean by type. But talk about your, your thing, your fling with the Heretic. It's really funny because right now I'm writing about it and what I'm going to probably tell you is kind of the news of the future or the news of the moment, not the, the news of the past. And it's, I felt really guilty after I, you know, there's some products that you can say, I reviewed this and it's unassailable. And it, you know, the LS35A, it is what it is. You can like it or not like it, but it, you can't like throw rocks, big rocks at it. <laughs> but when I reviewed the heretics, which I hadn't, I hadn't really fallen in love with the speaker in, I think, you know, the Snell A's. I mean, there's wow. a handful of speakers, wow. but they're not that many, mm -hmm. you know, the old quads. But this speaker just, in, I knew in like 10 seconds that it was me. Yeah. That is huge. The idea of, this is my identity. And the more I listened, and that includes this morning before I came here, I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not embarrassed to say, and it's a very different kind of speaker from the normal orthodoxy, but it's me. Mm. And it presents music with a, a kind of 
I call it singers wearing shirts and pants. You know, it's like you could, and they're kind of standing a little closer, and I yeah. feel closer yeah. to the performers. Not to mention, the thing resolves really fine, like a really good lens. It does a shading. Because I was at Hearst Place last week, and yeah, that the texture and subtle shifts and dynamics, which sounds like live music, it does that really, really well. The small shifts yeah, are yeah. really, you can watch them going down. Yeah. Like, look, it's vibrating. So it's like a more direct connection. Abs direct is the word. It's kind of Absolutely. like what I'm saying about listening to uh, Randy Newman. Yeah, I feel like through all that space and time, he's right there. You know? this, this next question comes to us from Brian, and it's a, I like the idea of this question is, He's saying that does the time where you became an audiophile, does that inevitably lead to you preferring that type of sound? And I'll just speak quickly for myself and say absolutely not, because I, my journey is always looking for new sensations like the, like the Lou Reed song. You know, I always want a new thing. Some of those new things are actually old things, but they're new to me. But I am not particularly stuck in any one type or sound or anything. You know, it's funny when I think of that. I came of age in the 60s, but I always think a lot of my senior friends, my uh, uh, people of my era, they got stuck in the 60s music-wise. Mm, yeah, yeah, They're yeah. still like the first thing they heard in the back seat of their Chevy, right. that's where their brain is still. Yeah. And I had to force myself, because of my friends who forced me, to evolve my taste and to keep listening. Right up to this day, I'm still looking for new... In when I came over here today, right. I wanted to turn you on to some new music. Right, right. Well, and we so, do this all the time, too. Right, and my answer to that is I am really... In not just the era, what influences me personally are people, and I'm very influenced by people. I want to, I want to please people by what I've discovered. Yeah, yeah. And that applies even to audio gear. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, even as being a reviewer, I want to please people by what I've discovered with what I've discovered. Right. But in other words, you're not stuck in the '60s or '70s. I've, but it's work not to be. I mean, <laughs> good. And I do believe I don't believe that equipment gets better, but I do believe that the aesthetic, like. The Spender BC-1 was a speaker. I never owned it, but it always impressed me. The Snell Type A's I never owned, but everybody's house that I went to, I was like, wow, that's yeah. a great speaker. Including mine, I had them. And those things still, they influenced me. So the taste of my friends definitely is maybe the biggest influence on, on what equipment I like, more okay. than anything, more than what's out there being reviewed by other reviewers, right. the taste of my inner circle friends is huge, including yourself. You've had a huge impact on me for 30, 40 years or yeah, something right. like that. Okay. Crowley sent in a question about DIY and the satisfaction of building. He has a Sun Valley and he has an L-Kit amp and he takes great pleasure from that, but the question is more about how does that stand up against non-DIY stuff for you? To the big stuff. To the big stuff? It's a really, really good question, Tom. When I'm sitting there at the computer typing this stuff out, and the music's playing over there, I can see through the screen. And I can see a lot of the readers. And I can see <laughs> global audio right through the screen without Google. Okay. And what I see is the majority of global audio is DIY. Wow. The real wow. spark, the energy, the, wow. the, the popping corn of audio is DIY. And whether the big magazines understand that, I don't know. But I know it's out there. And I believe it feeds, especially younger audiophiles. Uh -huh. And it also feeds the, the triode and the, two, and the horn thing that I was alluding to because you can build horns in your basement. You can build a simple triode amp in your kitchen. And these kits, to answer your question, especially the, the, the L kit TU89 or 8600s, these things, if you, with the right parts, and Victor curates the parts pretty well, 
You're listening to the equivalent of a top of the line Shindo or audio number. Really? Absolutely. I'll, I'll public record because the quality of the transformers and the capacitors. Mm. The rest is just some old vintage circuit that, you know, there's a lot of subtleties that go into building an amp. But for like two or three thousand dollars, I you could put this thing up against twenty thousand, I believe. And phono stages is another story. I personally like the Sun Valley phono stage and partly because and I use it mainly as a moving magnet, but partly because it, it throws the music into the room. It has a certain energy. And I use really, really good NOS tubes. I'm not using generic Chinese okay. tubes from today or yeah. Russian tubes or whatever tubes. I'm using the best of the... And that might be 80% of it. My point is, parts and tubes with this kind of gear okay. can take you to a very high level. So, Herb... You know what we're going to do right now? Viewer system of the day. Yes! Yes, that's what we're going to do. He needs me to remind him. Yeah, I, I'm stuff. getting old, man. He's getting old. Here it is. As soon as I opened Tom's email and saw his cat, Luna, sitting on top of his DIY DeVore 09D3 speakers, I'm thinking, yeah, we have a winner. And Tom, by the way, lives in Norway. His power amplifier, his integrated amp, is a Sugden A21SE turntable is his dad's old Rotel RP3000 from somewhere back in the 1970s and it's fitted with a HANA EH cartridge. Phono preamp is a Parasound JC3 Plus Junior. Anyway, beautiful, great shot. Thank you, Tom. And so we are back. My name is Steve Guttenberg. This is Herb Reichert. We are happy to be here. This could be a regular thing. Come back on August 14th for the live stream. Uh, but if you dig what we're doing here on the channel, please consider joining the Patreon to do so. Super easy to do. It's on the screen right now, the address. And uh, if you like the things that Herb and I are doing and the reviews and the thought pieces and audiophiliac viewer system of the day, all of that and so much more, check it out the Patreon that is. And if you like a video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you just want to mm, subscribe, subscribe to the channel as I inch, slowing down to 250,000. We just hit 239,000. So 250 is possible. Anyway, later this year, that magic number may or may not occur. But in any case, my work here and our work here is at last complete. Thank you again for watching. Hope to see you back here again on August 14th, but even sooner than that. Thank you, guys.